So we'll get to the events of yesterday and try to put them into context and say something about what they mean. But we really can't talk about yesterday unless we back up. And what I would like to try to do this evening relatively briefly, the operative term being relatively, is to say something about the death of two dreams. Uh, we confront a sad time in the Jewish world. Uh, it is absolutely true that we have no luxury of sitting back idly and saying there's nothing we can do. There's a lot we can do and there's a lot that AJC can do and does do. But it is still the case that we are living through very, very sad times in the Jewish world. And in order to say something or to put it into context, what did I mean by the death of two dreams? Since Jordana was kind enough to mention the book that I wrote when we first got to Israel and I unfortunately tracked what it was like to live through the first intifada, I'll say a brief word about our making Aliyah in 1998 and then I'll come back to something else uh, familial a little bit later. Uh, we made Aliyah in a very simple kind of a way. When I proposed to my wife that we spend our junior year in the same city because she was in school in Boston, I was in school in New York, and we were getting serious, and I thought oh, it might be worthwhile to spend a year in the same city, at least, to see if there was any there there. She said, sure, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? And I said, great, why don't we go to Oxford? And she said, why don't we go to Jerusalem? So we compromised and we went to Jerusalem. <laughs> a few years there, during that year in Jerusalem, uh, I proposed. And she said, yes, on condition that we live in Israel. To which I said, that is not happening. We live in Israel. <laughs> and uh, the whole story of how she pulled this off is a sad story for the men in the crowd, a great victory lap for the women in the crowd. So I will not tell you the story in detail. But suffice it to say that we moved in 1998. I wasn't aware that we were moving. She was aware that we were moving. I thought we were going for the year. It's a long story. It's a sad story. but. Thank God my analyst is on 24-hour call. <laughs> and when we made Aliyah in 1998, there was a guy you may remember uh, named Bibi Netanyahu. And he was prime minister. And there was a guy named Ehud Barak, who you may actually not remember. Uh, and he was running against Bibi Netanyahu for prime minister. And he won. He actually won. And we lived on a little street in the southern neighborhood of Jerusalem. And people left and right and middle, some people thought that what Barack was going to do was a great idea. Some people thought that what Barack was going to do was a bad idea. A lot of people weren't really sure. But this much was clear in that 1998, 1999 year when we were there ostensibly for one year. It was clear that because Barack won, peace was at hand. Some people thought the deal was a bad deal. But it was clear that it was going to happen. People walked out on the streets, I still remember, with wine bottles and glasses, and people were filling each other's glasses with wine, and there were beers, and people were singing, and not, you know, not dancing in the streets. It wasn't 1947, but it was, still, it was still a very, very, very memorable night. A lot has changed since that election, since Ehud Barak promised us three things. The boys out of Lebanon, peace with Syria, and peace with the Palestinians. The boys came out of Lebanon, thank God, almost exactly 18 years to the day after they'd gone in. Uh, the boy who actually got out last, out of the gate, it was actually videoed, of course, on Israeli TV, everything's videoed on Israeli TV, and he got off this armored personnel carrier, went to the chain link fence, put a chain on it, put a lock on it, hopped back on the armored personnel carrier, picked up his cell phone, called his mother and said, Ima Zenigmar, mommy, it's over. He had been born, basically, in 1982, when Israel first gone into Lebanon. So that we got. Peace with Syria, we didn't get. There hardly is a Syria to have peace with anymore. And peace with the Palestinians, we didn't get precisely because we tried. We didn't get peace with the Palestinians because, you know the whole story, Camp David with Arafat, with Barak, it all went nowhere. And there's going to always be a debate what happened at Camp David and what maps were offered and what maps were not offered and what was put on the table and so on and so forth. But I want to review it for a brief moment because it was the beginning of the death of the first of the two dreams. Whatever happened at Camp David, and Israeli prime ministers are not always fans of going to Camp David, when Menachem Begin had to go to Camp David with Sadat 
whom he didn't yet like, although they became very good friends, and with Jimmy Carter, who we always detested, and in the name of consistency, detested till his last living day. When, when the staff of the Israeli delegation got out of the cars at Camp David, I've never been, but I'm told it's very pretty and wooded and cabins and this and that, and they were trying to cheer Begin up because he was really not very happy about being there at all. They said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, this is actually pretty nice, huh? And he looked at it and he said, Auschwitz Deluxe, <laughs> which was his way of saying, it's pretty, but I don't want to be here and we're trapped and bad things are going to happen to us. Now, at the end of the day, bad things didn't really happen because he was a very good negotiator. But when Arafat and Barack and Clinton went back to Camp David, something happened and some map was put on the table. And I remember watching with my middle son, who is now in his seventh year in the Army, 25 years old, never seen the inside of a college classroom, not about to see the inside of a college classroom, in a unit that we won't discuss. Um, he was a little kid. And every night we would turn on CNN, back before that was a dirty word, and we would actually watch what was happening at Camp David. And every day the news was getting a little worse, that it wasn't working out, that Arafat was threatening to leave, that, that Barack was threatening to leave, that Clinton was losing his patience, et cetera, et cetera. And then one day, the news did not lead with Camp David. It led with the fact that a plane had crashed. It was the French, you know, the supersonic jet that had crashed. That was the end of that. And then Camp David was the second story. And the Camp David story was simply this, that the sides had not agreed that Arafat had picked up and pulled out and was going home, and that Ehud Barak was coming home, and he was coming home a kind of a wounded politician. And I remember that my son said to me, what's gonna happen now? This was the summer of 2000. So that's what, 14 years ago, summer? Right, 14 years ago, so he was 11. He said, what's gonna happen now? And I explained to him very clearly. People don't fight for a very, very, very long time and then make up on the spot. When you've been fighting for a long time, it takes a long time to make up. But you can, and you will, because it's in both people's interest. Now, I couldn't have known in July of 2000 that by October of 2000, we were going to be at the beginning of the Second Intifada. And that what was going to die in the Second Intifada was two major things, and I'm referring now not to the Israeli victims and not to the Palestinian victims, and there were victims on both sides, but the two major things that died in the Second Intifada were, number one, the Israeli left. Because the Israeli left had always been predicated, in terms of foreign policy at least, on a notion that we're going to give them land, they're going to give us peace. Now, there were Israeli prime ministers that always said, that's ridiculous. Why don't we give them peace and they give us peace? Why is our ending the conflict not a concession and their ending the conflict is a concession? They give nothing but just say words, and we move people out, bulldoze towns, etc. Why does it have to be like that? Yitzhak Shamir was the first, was the main proponent of this peace for peace idea, but nobody bought it. It was going to be land for peace. And what died in September, October of 2000, and over the very bloody and murderous four years that would follow, was first of all the Israeli left. Because Israelis began to see that if Arafat had wanted a deal, but Barak just didn't give him the right map, he had the following option. He had, after all, stolen millions and millions and millions of dollars from the Palestinian people and put it in banks in France and Switzerland and so on and so forth. So he could have taken a quarter of a million dollars, chump change for Arafat at that point, and bought the back page of the front section of the New York Times. And he could have said, this is the map that I was offered. And for the following six reasons, I cannot accept this map. And when the map moves to this line, we have a deal. And at the same time, he could have said to the hundreds of thousands of Palestinian workers who then had work permits to be in Israel, go sit on the highway between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and the highway between Tel Aviv and Haifa and just sit there, Martin Luther King style, Nelson Mandela style, just sit there on the highway for hours and paralyze the country because the other north-south the other north -south highway, the number six, wasn't yet built. And he could have at the same time called CNN said, film all of this. So had anything gone wrong with the Israeli security forces, it all would have been documented. The country would have been brought to a halt. Barak would have been forced to go back to some place, whether it was Camp David or some other place, to sit with Arafat and to negotiate the line here to here. And he probably would not have gotten everything he wanted, and we would have given up more than we wanted, but at the end of the day, there would have been a deal. 
What did the Israelis learn? That Arafat never wanted a deal. It was clear that he never wanted a deal, and therefore what he did was unleash a very well-orchestrated intifada, the story of which you tragically know. The first death, therefore, was of the Israeli left. And when the New York Times or CNN or anyone else out there says, Israel has lurched to the right, that's actually not entirely true. Israel, a, a higher percentage of the Israeli electorate votes right only because the left died. And the left was killed by the Palestinian refusal to make a deal. That's the first thing that died. But the second thing that died slowly but surely was this notion that we were going to live to see peace. We became the first generation of Israeli parents who sent our kids off to war. And I say that not metaphorically. Literally, we sent our kids off to war. We ourselves sent kids off to war. My daughter and her husband, my daughter and my son-in-law, were both drafted again this summer. They've been out of the army for years. They were both called up. She's a corporate lawyer. She spent 40 days in the reserves. He's a graduate student. He spent 50 days in the reserves. It's not a joke. We're the first generation of Israeli parents who does not say to itself, if our kids just do what's asked from them, their kids won't have to go to the army. Or at least their kids won't have to go to war. We're under no illusion that our children's children will not have to go to war. And so what died was the sense that anybody in our own lifetimes, that anybody in the lifetime of anybody in this gorgeous sanctuary was going to live to see peace. But here's what we held on to. We held on to the basic assumption that this was fundamentally, as the Palestinians always said it was, a battle about Palestinian statehood. Perhaps they weren't ready to make a deal yet. Perhaps they had not built, as we had prior to 48, the democratic institutions that make a democracy run so that when they pulled the plug or pressed the button, or whatever metaphor you want to use, that the state would be up and running. Israelis or Jews had done that in the issue for decades prior to May 14, 1948, and the Palestinians have not done it so well until now. You can get thrown in jail for a Facebook posting about Mahmoud Abbas. And if you're a young woman who has sex outside of marriage, your father can actually shoot you and kill you, and you'll be jailed for a day. In Hamas, by the way, in the Gaza Strip, they don't jail you at all. In the West Bank, you have to kind of check in. This is not the instant. There's no freedom of the press. There's no freedom of assembly. I remind you that Abbas is in the ninth year of his four-year term. So this is not the institutions of a democratic society ready to roll as soon as the button gets pressed. But we still did hold on to the sense, the Israelis, that even though it was probably true that our children's children would literally go to war, this was fundamentally a battle about Palestinian statehood. They wanted a state. And we wanted them to have a state. I still want them to have a state. So they weren't ready now. They'd be ready later. And the question was, were we giving up 96 or 97, 96.5% of the West Bank? Was this town in? Was that not town in? I actually have a very good friend who worked with me at the Mandel Institute when I was working there, who lives in Kfar Adumim. And one day we were there in the winter and the wind was rattling through her house, and she's not poor, and the windows were literally shaking. And I said to her, why don't you replace the windows? And she said, because here's the question. If it's 96%, I stay, this house is in Israel. If it's 97%, this house is in Palestine. And even though I'm opposed personally, she said, the deal's going to happen soon. And I'm not putting in whatever number of thousands of dollars it is on these windows until I know if it's 96 or 97 percent. Now she can put the windows in because her grandchildren will be in that house if she wants them to be long before there is a settlement. But we still believed that it was about Palestinian statehood. And that was the good news because conflicts over territory at the end of the day are solvable conflicts. Conflicts over territory at the end of the day mean somebody draws a line. Everybody's hopefully equally unhappy. And then the sides retreat. Nobody has to love, any has to love anybody. You go to Cyprus, you go to the Greek side, you go to the Turkish side, they despise each other. And we went and we crossed the border between Greece and Turkey on the Cyprus, on the island of Cyprus, and it's a whole to-do. 
You can't bring cars and you gotta have visas and all this and that, and they're unbelievably different. You can guess which one is a little bit more modern and all that. Doesn't make any difference. They despise each other. But since they separated and put one group on one side and one group on the other side, nobody's been killed. It can be done. Which brings us to 2014. Why did Hamas do what it do, did this summer? I mean, it knew that we had Iron Dome. And we knew, by the way, that they had tunnels. This notion that we were surprised by the tunnels. How'd they get Gilad Shalit? By helicopter? Remember Gilad Shalit? How'd they ever get him? They came out through a tunnel. The Israelis have known about the tunnels for a very, very, very long time. They didn't tell the Israeli population about it very much. And when the Gilad Shalit thing happened, everybody was so upset about Gilad Shalit, nobody stopped to say, how'd they actually get him? But we've known about the tunnels for a very long time. They, couldn't, they could have done some horrible things in the tunnels. They couldn't have brought down the state. They could have killed hundreds of people. They could have kidnapped dozens of people. We know that they could ride motorcycles in these tunnels, I'm assuming you know. And you know that when we captured some of them and killed some of them on our side of the border, they were armed with lots of explosives and handcuffs and injectable sedatives. You only have that stuff if you're planning to take people back alive into Gaza. They could have done horrible, horrible things, but they couldn't bring down the state. You can't bring down a country by kidnapping a family or 10 families. You can't do it. So why did Hamas do what it did? It did it in large measure because its stock was falling and it wasn't getting anything. It needed to restore its standing in the Arab world. But it did it really very successfully, by the way, to change the tenor of the conflict. Because Hamas makes no pretense that this is about territory. They don't pretend. You've got to give them credit. They're totally honest. As is, by the way, Hezbollah. This will be over when we are over. They, they say that. Go on their website. It's in Arabic. You can't blame them. Our websites are in Hebrew. But go on their website. Plug it into Google Translate, and you get some variation on what they're trying to say. Hamas unleashed this battle this summer to change the tenor of what happened. And what's happened in the last few weeks? There was a guy, Rabbi Yehuda Glick, who was shot right outside the Begin Center. It's important to know who he was shot by, not the guy's name, but where the guy worked. The guy worked in the Begin Center, at a restaurant which the Begin Center goes to great lengths to say was not owned by the Begin Center, fine. But the restaurant's in the Begin Center. And the guy worked in the kitchen in the restaurant. He knew Yehuda Glick. Yehuda Glick knew him. Yehuda Glick said the New York Times has been agitating for Jewish access to the Temple Mount. That's true. He's been doing it for a decade. He didn't wake up two weeks ago and say, I'd like to agitate today. For a, we for a decade, he's been saying, if the Arabs have access to the Temple Mount because it's sacred to them, that's fine. That the Jews had access to the Temple Mount too. It was never about us instead of them. It was us with them. So it was so terrible about what he did. What was terrible about what he did was that Hamas was very successfully trying to turn this into a conflict not about land. And in attacking somebody who was known for their role in trying to create greater Jewish access to the Temple Mount, suddenly the Temple Mount and Jerusalem we're in the center of everybody's attention. So what did Israel do? According to the New York Times, Israel closed the Temple Mount to Muslim worshipers. That's true. The part that the New York Times did not point out is it closed the Temple Mount to everybody, to Muslim worshipers, to Jewish worshipers, to tourists, to everybody. The Temple Mount was closed. Why? Because it didn't want rioting. So in a relatively even-handed way for a couple of days, Israel closed Temple Mount. But now the Temple Mount, of course, has become the big story. And then there are, of course, all of these attacks across Jerusalem, Al-Quds, the holy city. You're standing on a sidewalk, a car comes careening and runs you down at a bus stop. During the second intifada, by the way, you could decide, as many people did, I'm not going to restaurants. I'm not going to the movie theater. I'm not going to go to a concert. I'm going to stay in my house. I'm not going to go to any of those public places because it's dangerous. A lot of people made that decision. We didn't. But a lot of people made that decision. You can't make a decision not to be on the sidewalk. You have to walk to the sidewalk to get to your car. We don't have driveways and garages. We barely have curbs. We barely have roads. 
You can't not go outside. And most Israelis who don't have cars and certainly don't want to commute into Jerusalem traffic have no choice but to stand at bus stops. What they've done now, and because it's not centralized, but it's individual people kind of doing those without any central control, so Israeli intelligence is basically worthless on all of this stuff. Not, as, not Israeli intelligence at all, there's just nobody to spy on. What this has become is a battle about whether or not Jerusalem is going to be livable for Jews. This is not about territory. This is not about 96, 97 percent, whether my friend Avital can put new windows in her house. This is about whether anybody like us can live in Jerusalem. Now we got to talk about the attack yesterday. But before we talk about the attack yesterday, and I, I say I hope, I don't know if that's right. I assume that you've seen some of the pictures. If you haven't, you need to. Because if you know Jewish history, then you know that what this was was not a terrorist attack, which is what everybody's been calling it. It was a pogrom. And if you say pogrom, you have to think Kishinev. And if you think Kishinev, you're thinking 1903. And the pogrom in Kishinev didn't kill that many people, although it killed several dozen. And there are stories that are hair-raising beyond the people that were axed to death and women who were disfigured in ways that I can't bring myself to describe right now, but you can figure out what they were. What was devastating about the Kishinev program of 1903 was that it was the 20th century. If it had happened four years earlier in 1899, don't take this too literally, but sort of, it would not have been a big deal. Because there were plenty of programs at the end of the 1800s. When Tsar Alexander II was murdered, there were all, not by a Jew, there were all sorts of people who did all sorts of things to the Jews, of course. But the 20th century was supposed to be something different. The 20th century was going to be the century of reason, the century of science, the century of progress, the century of modernity. And the curtain had barely lifted on the 20th century when Kishinev happened. Theodor Herzl was just months away from the end of his life. And he grew desperate. And he said, forget Palestine. It's not happening. We'll take this crazy British offer of Uganda. It wasn't actually Uganda. It was in Sudan, but it doesn't matter. It was called the Uganda Plan. Created a huge schism in Zionist circles. But Herzl explained himself very clearly. We have to get out of here. Who could have known in 1904 how right he was? So the Jews left. They left because Herzl warned them. They left because 15 years earlier, Pinsker had warned them in his book, Auto Emancipation. They left. Millions of them came here, and they are your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. They were mine, too. A few went to Palestine and decided to build a state. Because the Poles had Poland, and the Italians had Italy, and the Germans had Germany, and the Russians had Russia. And all, all those peoples had in common was they had cultures, and languages, and histories, and foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Jews did too. The only thing that we didn't have was a state. And what Herzl, and Pinsker, and Nordau, and many others saw, said was, just have a state. This will stop. It won't be perfect. It won't be easy, but it won't happen anymore. And it didn't. We fought a lot of wars. And a lot of boys died. A lot of girls died too. But what happened yesterday was a pogrom. They walked into a shul, not with a suicide belt, but with a gun and an ax. You don't go into a shul with an ax to kill people. You go into a shul with an ax to butcher people. They were not trying to kill Israelis. They were trying to kill Jews. They were trying to make a statement that you saw, but you didn't want to believe in the summer of 2014, that the sickness that took over Europe in the middle of the 20th century, that for a few short decades was apparently in remission, is back full bore. Signs in Belgium that say, dogs allowed, Zionists never. Protests throughout Germany, France, England. My neighborhood in Jerusalem is getting so French so fast, it's actually dizzying. 
Now it's very good for the bakeries. But you see these people on Shabbat afternoon talking French. We used to hear English, Hebrew, Russian. Everybody's talking French. Sounds very romantic. But then you actually talk to these people. And you want to be nice. You know, they say about Israelis that they love immigration and they hate immigrants. So try not to be Israeli. Trying to be nice. So we're walking down the street on Shabbos afternoon. And instead of saying to them, what the hell are you doing in my neighborhood? I say, oh, you know, welcome. What brings you here, might I ask? You know, you sort of talk to people. And they tell you these stories. My kid got beaten up on the Champs-Élysées. Because, by the way, Jews cannot walk the Champs-Élysées at night. It's just known. You can't. It's not open to you. It's the Arab kids' Champs-Élysées. But my kid walked it. And he got beaten up. So we took him to the police station to file a report. But the policeman behind the counter was a Muslim. And he wouldn't take the report. So we're here. Jews are fleeing Europe again. Jews are fleeing Europe to the place where they were told where it wasn't going to happen anymore. And it happened again. And the second dream that died was the notion that this was a territorial conflict. It's not a territorial conflict anymore. It's a religious conflict. And I don't want to say, by the way, that there's not a bunch of Jews on our side of the line who see it as a religious conflict, too. There are. There are. But they are a minority. And they are in pretty strict control of the government that watches them very carefully. But there's some. But it's nothing like what's happening over there. Do you know that the Jordanian parliament today began its session with a moment of silence? in memory of the two attackers in the synagogue? The Jordanian parliament, not the Syrian parliament, if it still meets, I have no idea. Not the Iranian parliament, not the Lebanese parliament, whatever the hell that is. Not the Egyptian parliament, which is Sisi's best friends. The Jordanian parliament, King Hussein, the modern King Abdullah, began today with a moment of silence and then prayers in memory of the martyrs who attacked the synagogue. So reports today the Algemeiner. I wasn't there, I'm only telling you what I read. But what happened in Belgium and what happened in Germany and what's happening in France and now what's happening in Jerusalem and what's happening in Amman is the resurgence of a worldwide disease. And that disease cannot be solved by getting out of 100% of the West Bank. It can't be solved by getting out of all of the West Bank and all of the Golan and it can't be solved by going anywhere. What's the real danger here? The real danger here is this. That Zionism made the Jews a promise. It never promised us a rose garden. But it promised us that life might not be easy, but there would be no more hackings of Jews. You wouldn't be safe, safe, because there would be enemies. We knew that way back when. Jabotinsky was very clear about that but they wouldn't come into your synagogue and hack you to pieces. Those days we were told, because we had a Jewish state, we're over. We all know from our personal lives, from our friends' lives, from our families' lives, that there is nothing more debilitating and nothing more corrosive and nothing more likely to make a person do crazy things than the loss of dreams. The dream of Zionism and the promise of Zionism were attacked horribly yesterday. And Israelis went to sleep, or sort of went to sleep, and I was literally up all night last night. A country that loses the dream. A country from which the promise is pulled out right from under it. Is a country fragile and likely to spring. That's the danger. And while Netanyahu was right yesterday to call for restraint, what he meant was restraint of individuals, he's not likely to sow restraint himself. Not because he is whatever he is and you can think whatever you think, I actually agree with some of that, but because he is not going to be the prime minister on whose watch the promise of Zionism dies.
I told you at the beginning that I'd come back to a uh, little familial thing. And with this, I'll conclude. Some number of months ago, I guess, two months ago, uh, my daughter and her husband came over. They live three minute walk away, which is a very nice thing. And we see them very often because our pantry is as well stocked as the local market and the prices are much better. So um, they come home with them in empty bags and they leave with full bags and they're happy. My wife is happy and I'm sort of happy. <laughs> but you already know how much my happiness marries in this equation, so it doesn't make that much difference. But this time they didn't come over for soup mix or this or that. They came and sat at the table with us and told us that she was expecting, which is wonderful. It's our first. It's very exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and you know what my first reaction was? And I've never told her this, so unless she watches Shalom TV, she won't know. My instantaneous reaction was, I hope it's not a boy. Not that I hope it is a girl, and I'm aware that those are the two options, <laughs> but I hope it's not a boy. That was my instantaneous reaction. And then I thought later that night, how crazy is that? That your first kid has her first kid, and your first reaction is, I don't want the kid going into battle. It's not normal. Where does this leave us? It leaves us with fortitude. We have to remember what you said before. The Jews have been in much worse places. We've been in places where we couldn't defend ourselves. We've been in places where there were no organizations like the AJC or any other that could do the work that it does. And we stuck our way through it, and we saw our way to the light at the end of the tunnel. This is not going to be quick. And this is not going to be easy. And it's not going to be pretty. But they are not going to win. And you and I are really partners on opposite sides of the ocean. We're going to do our work each in different kinds of ways. But we're going to do what we need to do, and we're going to call who we need to call, and we're going to join what we need to join we're going to lock arms and steadily but surely put one foot in front of the other to fight this every which way that we can and to defend ourselves there every which way that we can. So that one day, a generation or two from now, when people sit in this sanctuary and talk about those years in 2014 and 2015 and 2016, it will be said of us, not that we gave up, but that we did everything that we had to do to make sure that the greatest days of the Jewish people lay not in the past, but in a glorious future still ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, can you name Palestinian leaders who envision living side by side with Israel, but who remain silent for fear that speaking out is too dangerous? Optimism springs eternal. The answer is no. I actually can't. And, um, whoa, I'm getting a lot of mail here. <laughs> Bing, you have something in your inbox. In any event, um, I can't. There were people like Sari Nuseba, who at Al-Quds University actually was forced to resign after there were basically pro-Hamas demonstrations on his campus, and he refused to say no. Then Brandeis cut its ties with him, and he lost his support, and in the end, he resigned. He was a moderate once. He's not a moderate anymore. There are others like that. Certain people in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, and in the New York Times, and on CNN, and in all sorts of other places yesterday, reminded us about Baruch Goldstein. We had one of those too, they said. You had a Jew that went into Hebron and did a horrible thing and shot up, I think, 29 people and, until he was killed by whatever. Horrible. Immoral, disgusting, I mean, every word you want to put on it. And there wasn't a rabbi in America Orthodox, conservative, reconstructionist, reform, confused, non-denominational, not yet ordained, not yet born. There wasn't a rabbi in America who didn't get up on her or his pulpit that week and say, this is not Judaism. There wasn't one. Now I want you to tell me which imam in America today spoke out. Name him. There's no her. Name him. The one at Yale? 
the one at the University of Chicago? Tell me who spoke out. Now, who's in danger in America? There's nothing more to say. Why does the U.S. State Department think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is over territory? Why does John Kerry say that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is leading to ISIS recruitment? How do we counter the movement in Europe to recognize Palestine as a state? That's part of the same, that's part of the same thing. They're all good questions, I and mean, they're really good questions. Here's the problem with the West, and you're part of the West. Sorry. The West does not believe in problems that have no solution. You just don't believe in those. By the way, there are problems that have no solutions. And I say the following, and I know it's going to be painful, so I'm not saying it to be crass or crude. But there's a word for problems that have no solution, and they're called oncology units. There are problems that have no solution. There's people who are sick that we can't save. There's people, God forbid, who are born with horrible things that we can't fix. There are people who are so depressed that they take their own lives, God forbid. I mean, there are horrible things, painful things in the world that have no solution yet. But when it comes to the geopolitical realm, we want to believe that everybody is as rational as we are. We want to believe that everybody fundamentally wants the same thing. George Bush used to say this, and now Barack Obama says this. You know, the Palestinians, George Bush literally said, actually, Palestinian moms just want to take their kids to soccer on Sunday. There are so many things wrong with that sentence that I don't even, there are more things wrong with the sentence than there are words in the sentence. But the idea was, because it's not soccer, and it's not Sunday, and it's not the moms are doing the driving, and there's no Dodge caravans with the pretty little trees in the background, doesn't make any difference. The idea was that they basically want the same thing for their children. I wish that were true, but it's not. And whenever I say this, people say, you're just a racist. I don't think I'm a racist, but it's just not true. When Baruch Goldstein did what he did, no Israelis went out and handed out candy to children across Jerusalem, but they handed out candy today. You can go on the internet and see this. They dressed up in Hamas uniforms with hatchets and signs that had pictures of the two guys. That's a sick society. It's a sick society. I want to remind you, no imam that I saw at least spoke out in America. America and the rest of the West are not willing to say that Islam has been hijacked. I mean, we pretend also, the Obama administration will not allow you to say terrorism. It's extremist fundamental, I don't know what it is. You can't say the war on Muslim radicalism, can't say that. You can't really say why every airport is filled with blue-shirted TSA agents. It's not because Native Americans don't want to be on reservations anymore, even though, no, they don't want to be there. And they were treated a hell of a lot worse than the Arabs on the West Bank. But you figured out a way to make Europe not talk about that. And we don't have TSA agents because Jewish grandmothers in Miami are upset about Obamacare. And we don't have TSA agents because, I don't know, descendants of the Daughters of the American Revolution don't like American immigration. You know exactly who the TSA agents are there for. But nobody will say it. Nobody will say it. And you can't fix a problem you won't identify. You have a child, God forbid, with a serious problem, you are not going to fix it until the parents can sit down and talk about it and name it. But until then, you're going to spin out of control, tragically. You can't fix this until you say that when there is Boko Haram and there is Islamic State and there is Al-Qaeda, and there is Hezbollah, and there is Hamas, and they are all variants of the same virus. Until you can say that, you can't fix this. So why does the State Department pretend? Because it will not be honest. And because Europe is basically in the same camp, stopping this progression of recognition of Palestinian state is going to be very, very, very hard. But here you can intervene. Here you actually can talk to smart, intelligent, rational people and explain to them why this is not only wrong and unfair. It's not in the interest of Palestinians. In the interest of Palestinians to have a state when the institutions of democracy are in place. 
not when it's going to be taken over by Hamas and it's going to be more repressive than the Palestinian Authority is. But nobody wants to have that conversation, tragically. Okay. The Iranian business. Um, a lot of good questions here. The Iranian business. Look, uh, somebody said best case scenario, worst case scenario. The best case scenario is that um, all the leaders of Iran wake up one morning and decide to become lifelong members of the American Jewish Committee. <laughs> and they do al chatanu lefanecha. And they, their wives join Hadassah. And uh, they come to policy conference. That's the best case scenario. It's not going to happen. Um, the best case scenario, which is also not going to happen, is that the Obama administration or the administration after that, whichever, whatever, wakes up and says, that's evil. And that no country that says explicitly that it wants a bomb so it can destroy another country is going to be allowed to get that bomb. How serious are you about defeating Islamic State if you're putting 1,500 soldiers on the ground? That's what you need to protect West End Avenue on Simchas Torah. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously? 1,500 soldiers? That's literally what lines Pennsylvania Avenue on, a, on Inauguration Day. You can't even dent Islamic State with 1,500 soldiers. A quarter of a million soldiers? Yeah. So you want to fight them or not fight them? You want them to take over or not take over? What would have happened if you hadn't had Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt? What would have happened if Roosevelt looked across the ocean and said, well, yeah, Pearl Harbor, that wasn't so good. But really, they're so big and they're so spread out. What are we going to do? You're just lucky that he wasn't afraid. And that's why you can be a Jew in this country, because they would have come here too. And that's why you can be a woman and a professional in this country. That's why you can live the life that you want to live. That's why you can go to Barnes & Noble and look at an amalgam of books that are everything from great to horrible, and it's your right to choose. Everything that you hold dear was at stake in 1941-42, and the United States decided not to let the world become a place that was unlivable. Here's what I want to tell you. Everything is at stake in 2014, and everybody wants to pretend it's just a rainy day. So you're going to wait. And then they'll do something. Why did we bomb a specific spot in Syria last week? One specific spot? We, you, bombed a specific spot? Because, said the State Department, that's where there is a group of Islamic State that they know for a fact can produce bombs that airport security cannot detect. So you want to do that without putting troops on the ground? It's a, it's a, it's a game. They're going to they're gonna come. And one day America's going to wake up. And the longer we wait, the more casualties will be on our side and the more casualties will be on their side. And the more the world's going to go into a very dark spin for a very long time. But I don't believe at the end of the day that France is going to let Sharia law come into it. I don't believe that they're going to do it. I don't believe that hundreds of years of French art, culture, music, opera, literature, etc., are going to be taken over by people who say that we're going to determine what you can read and what you can't read, and women are going to cover their faces on the street. I don't believe the French are going to do it. And I'd like, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't believe that they're going to do it. And one day they're going to say, we've had it. And it's going to get very, very ugly. And I believe that one day that's going to happen here too. One bomb in one subway station, you only have to kill five people. You paralyze New York City for good. What are you going to do? Put metal detectors in the front of every subway station? 59th Street, Columbus Circle at 9 o'clock in the morning. What are you going to do? You can paralyze the whole city with one hand grenade. They're coming. Nobody wants to take it seriously. So the worst case, the best case scenario of Iran is obviously that they all join Hadassah and AJC and all that. But the real best case scenario is that Washington wakes up and says to Iran, no. What the, the, the foul garbage that you spew is evil, and we've been there before. We're going to destroy you. And we're going to destroy ISIS, ISIL, whatever. We're going to destroy Boko Haram because you can't 
kidnap girls in the 21st century and sell them into sex slavery, and Michelle Obama holds up a sign, bring back our girls. That's not okay. No, I'm serious. I'm not trying to be cute. It wouldn't be okay to put a hashtag and say, please don't send Jews to Auschwitz. I, I have a very active Twitter account, but I'm under no illusion that hashtags save anybody. Hashtag, please don't send our children to Auschwitz, didn't do any good. No, I'm serious. It didn't do any good. And that's what we did in the Second World War. No Jews marched on Washington. 400 Jews one day. One day. What, there were no buses? Jews didn't know what was going on. Jews knew very well what was going on. Read Deborah Lipstadt's book, Beyond Belief. They didn't know where the capital was. It wasn't cavemen. It was the 1940s. Many of you were alive, and certainly your parents were alive. You could march in Washington, but no Jews did. It was really no better than Michelle Obama's hashtag thing. If there's evil, you have to fight it. Don't hold up a sign in the White House. Send troops to Africa and save the girls. Don't tell me it can't be done. I refuse to believe it. Get France and England and Germany and Japan and the United States and normal countries and save the girls. And don't pretend that you don't know what's happening to them, that you do, because you do, and you don't care. You just don't care. I don't mean you, but they don't care. It's an embarrassment. It's a humiliation. It's despicable. For this, the West was saved. So the best case scenario is the West would wake up and would actually stand for something. And it would look at the Middle East and it would say, actually, you know the country that actually mirrors our values? Right of free assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, universities of the highest caliber, women who can be heads of state, you haven't quite gotten there yet. You may come close, but we'll see what happens, et cetera, et cetera. Which country does that? It is not Saudi Arabia, because you can't run for parliament if you can't drive there. It's us. When's the State Department going to come out and say, actually, American values, Jeffersonian values, Franklinian values, Washingtonian values, they're actually alive and well in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and they're not alive and well anywhere else in that region. Why can't somebody say that? The best case scenario was that somebody would say that. And I would suggest to you, and this is not a political endorsement of any sort, we don't even know who's running yet, but when you go to the polls in 2000, in 2000 whatever, in two years, that should be your question. Who's going to speak about the values of America that make America great and do what it takes to preserve those values all across the world? That's all that matters. The worst case scenario with Iran is this, and this is actually not, this is less hallucinatory than, you know, Ahmadinejad joining AJC. This is a worst case scenario, uh, but it's actually possible. There is either a very bad deal with Iran or no deal with Iran. It's the same thing, right? I mean, they meet. Because at the end of the day, they just go ahead and do whatever centrifuges do. And Bibi decides, not on my watch. Now, I was very privileged to be at a breakfast a couple of months ago with Henry Kissinger. He said, there's no way that Israel can do it. No way Israel can attack Iran. Just cannot stop it. Now, he's right or he's wrong. I don't know how much he knows. I don't know what kind of access he has these days. That's what he said. But there may be things that Israel's planning that we don't know about. And Bibi decides, I can't stop it, but I can dent it. And I'm not just going to let it happen on my watch. So Israeli planes go, and they do what they do, and they come back, and probably a lot of boys get shot down on the way and on the way back. But then the, the rockets come from Lebanon. We have no Iron Dome for the rockets from Lebanon. The rockets from Lebanon can reach a lot. The rockets from Lebanon make the stuff from Hamas look like stuff that you could buy in a toy store. Much more accurate and much more powerful and many, 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 many tens of thousands of them. And we can't stop them. So Iran gets a little bit upset about all these Israeli warplanes flying over its skies and it gives a little signal to Hezbollah and the rockets start flying. And they take out some hospitals. They take out some bridges. Take out some power plants. The IDF announced two weeks ago that if this happens, the airport's for sure getting closed on the first day of the war. Do you know how much food Israel has in store, in stock? You ever ask yourself that question? Israel has two weeks of food. 
two weeks and we're out. So you can imagine a world in which Israel strikes Iran because it's just not going to let this happen. And Iran fights back through Hezbollah and we are, we are really battered. And we need blood and we need plasma and we need doctors and we need surgical units and we need and we need and we need and we need and the United States says we're coming. The big ships are on their way and we've got food and water and plasma and this and that and the map. And we're going to show you where the border is going to be. This time it's not for negotiation. We're coming. That's a very bad scenario and it's not pie in the sky. And if and when it happens, it'll happen because nobody in the White House of either party had the guts to stop it before it was too late. Our son is scheduled to attend Hebrew University for his junior semester abroad. He's departing in January for six months. We're concerned, dash, very concerned, should we send him. For Israeli's life goes on, but he has to go on the sidewalk. OK, very fair question. So do Israelis have to go on the sidewalk. Israelis also have to go on the sidewalk. But here's what I think about the Jews. That's what I think about every single one of us. I include myself and every single one of you. You got to decide what in life means more to you than life itself. We have always, as Jews, believed that there were such things. If there's nothing in the world that matters to you more than your staying alive or your child staying alive, what do you believe in? And if you don't believe in anything, that's why they're going to win. Because they do believe in things. It's sick. It's dysfunctional. And I don't want us to believe like that. We've got to believe in something. Because whatever it is that we would die for, we'll also live for. I, like you, adore my children. I'll end with this story. I wasn't going to tell it, but I, I adore my children. I don't love them any less than you love your children. I'm probably no more than you love my children. Sometimes a little less, maybe. And I've sent them off to war. I didn't send them. They were taken. The army has a system. There's computers. They... So my daughter was a first-year law student. And it was Hanukkah. And we were at war. In Gaza, I forget if it was cast lead, cloud this, whatever it was. She's in her second year, three years of law school, a year at the court. So it was like six years ago, something like that, whatever it was. First year of law school is a hard year of school, as you, some of you know. And she was like every other law student, working her tushy off to stay on top of things. She wasn't yet married. And um, she comes home one day, and she says, uh, my commander called me from the army. And he said, this is completely off the record, but I just want you to know, you should know where your stuff is. So she said to me, what am I going to do if I get called up? They're not going to stop school. I'm going to miss a week. I'm, I'm going to be through. So I said, we'll handle it. Maybe you won't get called up. It's Hanukkah. My wife and I are literally putting the candles in the Hanukkiot in front of the window. And she's called us earlier in the day to say that she's been called up. And she has to go to Gaza. Not like to a base. She's going to go to Gaza. And I said to my wife, when Tali gets home, we are going to have a massive meltdown on our hands. And my wife said to me, we'll handle it, which means you'll handle it. <laughs> Tali's mine. She takes care of the other ones. We got a whole division of labor thing going on. She's a tiny little thing. She comes home. We're lighting candles. She's in a horrible mood. She goes up to the attic where she stores all her gear, the boots, the army uniform, the bag, all the stuff. And she comes down. And um, we fill the Hanukkah for her, too. And we were, we said the brachot, you know, we said the first blessing and the second blessing, and then Hanebot Halalu, which we do. 
and she's under my arm. I got my arm around her, and she's crying. She's scared. She's going to Gaza. If you're not scared, you're stupid. So she's crying, and she's tiny, and so you can feel every like rib move. And I held her. What are you going to do? And then we started to sing Mao's Tzor, which, you know, bum, 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 bum. It's got a lot of stanzas. Most people don't sing all the stanzas because they can't wait for their aunt or grandmother to stop playing the piano. But in any event, there's a lot of stanzas. And this one's about the, Ro the Romans, and there's one about the Greeks, and there's one about the Egyptians, there's one about the Persians. Each one, they were really, really bad, but at the end of the day, we got them. And then the last stanza, which was actually added later, says, Chasof zeroa kochacha v'karev keitz ha-Yeshua. Bear your mighty arm, your mighty holy arm, and bring closer the day of redemption. Ki lanu ha-Yeshua ve'en keitz limei ha-ra'a. Because salvation is taking too long to come, and there's no end to the evil. That's why Mao's tour matters. And we were singing it, and she speaks Hebrew as well as she speaks English. And I felt her whole body change. She stopped crying. And she stood up straight. And she stopped that little whimpering thing. And she sang, Ki Because it is taking far too long for redemption to come, and there's no end to the evil. And that's why she understood to hell with law school. She clerked at the Supreme Court. It worked out okay. But it doesn't matter in law school. And you have to go to Gaza. Because there's no end to the evil. And we finished singing Maus Tzor, and it was a cold, wintry Jerusalem night. And she put on her green little coat that they give you. And she put on her backpack. And she gave us a hug. And she walked out the door, and she went to war. And if kids don't do that, we're not going to have a story to tell. So nobody's asking your kids to go to war, and nobody's asking your kids to go to Gaza, and nobody's asking your kids to do anything except not to run away from being Jewish. Don't let them win. Because we're right. Because we believe that people should be able to do whatever they want in their bedrooms without us butting our heads into it. And we believe that women should be able to be whatever they want to be. And women should be able to study whatever they want to study. And people of different faiths should be able to worship however they want to worship. And that the Jews deserve a state no less than the Poles and the Greeks and the Italians and the Russians and the Spanish and so on and so forth. I believe all those things. You believe all those things. And if you believe those things, we all have to band together and defend it with every single fiber of our being, putting our beliefs ahead of our safety. That is what has kept the Jewish people here for 4,000 years, and that is what will keep us here for the next 4,000 years. Thank you very much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.